life was that river. And that river taught value. And it also taught people how to sustain themselves. On days after the flood, we were told not to drink water from the taps, so we drank water from the river. On those days when someone came to the house in the morning, the first thing they looked at was the bucket of water. If the water was murky and muddy, they knew the water had just recently been dipped from the river. If the water was clear, they knew the water had been dipped from the river the night before. Regardless of whether the water was muddy or clear, everybody drank a cup of coffee before leaving our house. When someone mentioned the muddy water in the buckets down at the river, it still makes us laugh today. Once or twice a year, it was certain the river flowed over its banks. River water poured into our house as high as the window sills. People watching the water rise in the river had a measure on the bridge up at Deming it took 10 hours for the water to reach the mouth of the Nooksack River where we lived. So we had time to put the beds and other things up before the water came into the house. We had to put a net around the wood and nail the net to the house or the wood would drift away. When we arrived in Bellingham, the Red Cross put everybody up in hotels. I will tell you about those flood days another time. Every time we'd get flooded, mom would go get that big hose and just squirt the whole house out and all the mud and everything. Our house that. never did go under, Dad. Yeah, because you had it up. Yeah. Dad always kept the, our house up. Remember, mm -hmm. Auntie, you guys' house was always um, still it's all the time down. Dad kept it raised. So yeah, we and um, and your grandpa too, Herman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his yeah, yeah. was house on still so yeah. yeah. I can remember looking in the floor hole. And then like a knot hole in the wood and you could see the river swirling mm -hmm. underneath there. But we used to roll up our linoleum and put it on the floor. Made sure that we put our shoes on top of the dresser. I remember my dad. I want you to sleep with one foot on the floor tonight, son. You know, put your foot on the floor. How come? Put your foot on the floor. He says, when your foot gets wet, it's time for us to go. Yeah, it's time for us to go because we used to have our boat tied to our doorknob when it was time, when it was flooding time. We used to have our boat tied to the doorknob. It's time for us to go. You know, little things like that, you know. Then when the water went back down, there was mud on the floor. We used to have a drill, drill a hole on the floor like that, take the hose and wash out the floor and build a fire really hot in the house and dry out the house. And away we go again. I just remember the flood sometimes. we get flooded out and Red Cross would come and get us and bring us to the Savoy Motel in, in Bellingham. And at least there, we'd get to go around and turn off the lights and stuff because we didn't have any light switches down there. We just had one little light bulb with a string on it in the middle of the 
in the middle of the living room. That was the only light we had. Flush the toilet, that was kind of cool. All the families that got to witness and experience those cycles down at the village, those were the foundational village site for the Lummi people along the Stalo or the river. It felt like home to us or something. I, I don't know. Every single day we walked from Gooseberry to the river and um, we still tied up our boat in front of Grandpa's house and shaved our poles and got ready for fishing. We spent all of our time, seemed like it, at the river, more, even more than we did at our new home. Yeah, I think I can almost remember everybody at the river and some of the people that moved and moved in, like after Marion Jefferson and Leonard moved, um, Haynes Julius and their family moved in there. And straight across from like uh, Leona and Aunt Fran's house was the war buses straight across to the other side and we used to holler back and forth to them. <laughs> Pretty much a fishing village is what it was down along the river. That's why everybody lived there is because it was convenient for your boats and your nets. Everybody had all their gear along the river. Like uh, we moved there every fishing season. Born, as uh, Larry would say, a poor Indian child on the Lummi Reservation. Uh, and we were poor. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Larry Kinley would always say, but we, uh, uh, we didn't know it until somebody told us. Because people said we're poor, we didn't know it because we always had something. All Indian food, too. Ducks, fish, smoked salmon, salt salmon. And you know, I hear when I went to school, you know, we had just plain sandwiches, that's what we ate. Fish sandwiches, you know. White people made fun of us because we were still eating Indian food. We didn't know nothing about what they had, baloney or whatever, you know. After springtime and everything, we knew that when the berries were gonna be done and when we had to go back in the woods and pick berries and do all this canning and, cause everything was gonna get ripe and stuff and we had to get them off, get, get them canned while they were still there. But I have fond memories of Aunt Addie. She used to make the clam fritters, and uh, she'd take the butter clams and she'd grind them and mix them with the eggs. And and I was I was just a little boy, and I went over to her house, and uh, uh, she made clam clam fritters, and she put it between two pieces of bread. I never had them like that before, between two pieces of bread, and like a like a patty and the bread, you know. And, and I told her, I said, Auntie, I said these are better than my mom's, you know, and, which I shouldn't have said, you know, but they were better than my mom's because my mom's fritters always kind of fell apart, you know, and, and hers all stuck together, you know. I thought these are better than my mom's and. Apparently, she told my mom, you know, and I heard about it, you know, for a while. So you think Auntie's fritters are better than mine? Oh, yeah, they were really good, you know, and, uh, but... When there was a uh, smokehouse was full of Hogan's in the wintertime, or we'd get sprouts, remember? Yeah. We'd get sprouts. We'd go up there and eat sprouts. On the weekends, uh, yeah. Yep, yep. We never went hungry. And berries. And yeah. berries. Salmon Remember berries. the um, salmon berries? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. we never went hungry. <laughs> And I 
I took Dad's boat to Baker's before. <laughs> oh my God! You did not. <laughs> we rode down rode without just fine, but coming up, we yep. didn't <laughs> <laughs> with our candy. <laughs> who was who was uh, who was uh, rowing? Because it was easy both going down. Both of us, we both had oh, one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah one, oh, one on one side, one on the other side. You guys, his arms would be too short. Yeah. yeah. Luckily, Howard oh, came by goodness. and said, what are you guys doing? And he told us, uh, he uh, got the, got his rope out and told us up river, remember? And we were thinking, oh, we're in so much trouble. He never told Dad. <gasps> oh, oh, my God. So we <laughs> she should never remember that part. <laughs> we went to the store, yeah, at Baker's. How do you guys even know how to do that? I don't know. Well, you could just drift down the river. Yeah. <laughs> you were able to drift down the river and park. That's the Darlene's and idea. <laughs> and tie it back is one of the problems. Yeah, going up the river. We were hanging on to the branches. Because <laughs> we were floating down, not up. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's crazy. Can I the only story I remember is um, Mom was pregnant with me, and she had to go to the hospital. And she was supposed to get in the boat, you know, skiff. And, um... The skip got away, of course. <laughs> we used to have a phone, and we were, we would call, this is what we did, we would call, we would take turns calling uh, Baker's. She had a laughing machine. <laughs> I'd go to the store, she would call Baker's, and he would run over and answer it, and I could hear that machine oh, laughing. <laughs> wow. And then I'd go out, and then she would go in, and then I would call <laughs> And I remember it was still kind of a hot summer, sunny day, and my sister Lori and Deborah were playing on a sandbar across. I don't know how they got over. They must have walked down the bridge, because you could you could climb down that bridge and get on the sandbar. We're holding hands, and uh, and the uh, um, sandbar was like this, and then pretty soon it went like that, and uh, and we just dropped straight down, and. Um, I remember seeing the uh, grass going like that in the water, and it was really pretty. And at first, when I first got in there, I got panicky. She knew how to swim. I don't know where she learned me. I don't know how, but I didn't know how to swim. But I knew how to dog paddle. But I panicked, and I grabbed her, and oh, where'd she go? Because she's so much smaller than me, so I kept pulling her down. And you know, she really is only two and a half years older, younger than me, so she, we were not, she was laid, weighed less than I did. But it was pretty scary, but after a while, it got real peaceful. And I quit screaming and everything, and pretty soon, I remember somebody grabbing my hair and throwing me in a boat. Deborah must have stepped in a, uh, in a little channel there, and she went over her head, and so she started drifting down, and that, and we were on the, mom and dad were on the other side of the bank and I, I was over there with them and I can remember mom and dad screaming. Just, we just happened to be going over the bridge and I could hear them hollering for help and Greg was with me on his car so we went flying down to where he parked his boat. And pretty soon there was a boat that come up and grabbed Deborah out of the water and pulled her in the boat, it was Connie Martin. If that boat didn't show up, Deborah probably would have drowned it. Harold Olson uh, uh, used to say, hey, you know, I saved your life once. My mom said, yeah, you had fell overboard and all that was sticking up was your, uh, your yellow hair. And uh, Harold reached over and grabbed me by the hair and pulled me out of the river. So, you know, all the families around there were real close. We caught many sturgeon in our river. I mean, great big sturgeons in our river. And uh, I used to watch those old guys butcher the sturgeon. And uh, it's a real trick to butchering a sturgeon, how to bleed them. And, uh, but we were the fish buyers for many years. And I used to listen to my grandfather and my granduncle talk about how the Nooksack River was connected to the Fraser, 
At one time, the Nooksack was a tributary to the Fraser, and that's why we used to have so many sockeye go up our river, and sturgeons go up our river, because they had the scent of the Fraser. You see, and uh, but then what happened was a farmer up there. built a dam and blocked off that tributary. So that cut us off from that scent. So we don't have no more sockeye or sturgeons going up our river anymore. But I used to watch them at the big drift, how they would, everybody would take their turn to set their net. Everybody was respectful of each other and take their turn. Uh, when it come time, and everybody shared, and if you were lucky, you got it, and if you weren't, you weren't. All the men in their skiffs used to get up and say, let's go clear the log jam. We didn't have an office or a business or anybody that did it for us. The guys got up and did it because they knew that this is our lifestyle and this is how we traveled was through the waterways. And they would tie the logs to their boat and then they would all take off and tow the logs out to let them adrift out into Bellingham Bay. And every year to protect their salmon, they would blow the dams in the river. They knew also that they had to protect the stocks. So guess what they did? They closed the season. They knew the seasons, they knew the cycles, and so they would target certain times where they would fish based on the demand. This is just within my lifetime. And because I used to go up by Loretta's and his mom's and his house, I would drive my skiff up there to go fishing. And so that was all clear enough to go through there, all the way down to second drag, all the way down to sawdust, and then to go out to third by fish point. It's all navigable that, at that time. So this is within the last 60, 70 years. The appointed fisheries person and their stories of what it was like, you know, tribal members were they knew the seasons, they knew the cycles, and so they would target certain times where they would fish based on the demand. And then uh, individuals would argue that they were illegal fishing without a license. So we used to fish right out here in uh, Bellingham Bay. And uh, they had a boundary line, I think it runs from Point Francis to the half road are they call Treaty Rock. From that big rock out on the other side of Lamia uh, Lies out point. to the can red can buoy over by Fair Haven. Uh, and they used to have a boat called the Governor John R. Rogers. And they'd be patrolling there all the time watching the boats, make sure they didn't drift over. And we you know, for years and years they'd done that to us and even when Jim, my brother Junior, was running a boat out there, we all fished with him. And I can remember us just picking it up so fast, you know, so it wouldn't drift and everything was done by hand. And we'd have to pick up real fast and ebb tide, make sure we didn't drift over that line, because that boat would be standing there watching us. They used to give us a hard time, the Governor, Governor John R. Rogers, run that line all day long running the, they were that strict to us that they that they made that uh, game warden run the line all day long when i was young and raising my family and everything i hated to miss a day of fishing i just couldn't think of not being out there with the rest of the boys you get that feeling, you know, that you want to be out in the water. We had good fishermen, you know, and we still do today. All Lummy boys are all good fishermen. 
I've done it from when I was big enough to row a boat too, so it's kind of natural for me, but I told you just can't jump in a boat and go fishing. You gotta learn waters, learn everything, you know, like, I don't even need a chart. I can just go sit in place I want, and I know if I'm in a reef or in a shallow water. Or... I think I started fishing on my own when I was probably 12 years old. I think my dad had a boat down in, uh, down the river, and when he was working, he had let, after school, he had let me take it. So I'd fish after school once in a while, but, but I always been on the boat with him. He tells me stories about me being on a boat with him in, uh, he says he always used to take diapers in a bottle, so he'd have to take care of me while we were fishing. That's the story he says. I don't know if it's true or not, but I hope so. It's kind of all I've done because it's what he's done. Probably the only thing I would do, because I love it so much. And now my son's into it, and he's fishing off on his own, so. And I see that. And I don't know how, I'm 50-some years old, my dad's 85. You know, and when the wind blows, he calls me, are you all right? You know, and, and that, I think that's pretty neat. But I'm probably going to do the same thing to my son when he's 50-some years old, and hopefully I'm 80-some. You know, and I wasn't the only one there. There was a lot of, a lot of my cousins and stuff were, were down there. And, you know, and if somebody's in trouble out there, everything stops. And to make sure everybody's all right and then go, go out back fishing again. So it's, it's kind of neat that way. It's kind of a, it's like a big family. You know, fishing's a, doesn't seem like work. It's just a way of life. My dad had been arrested so many times for fishing outside of the state regulations. They were going to put him in jail. My uncle uh, was telling me about my dad, the, the, my mom and him were sitting in the car at the end of Hoff Road, which is above Treaty Rock. Uh, that's where Treaty Rock is, is right below the Treaty, uh, below the Hoff, Hoff Road. Uh, they were sitting in their car watching my dad hang on to the end of his net in a storm as the waves were breaking up onto the road and on their car. So if you go out to uh, out Marietta or uh, out Hoff Road and sit there and look, uh, you can't even get your feet wet. Uh, probably for another mile out there where where the where the bay is now. So so that's a big changes in the whole river system there uh, since those times. But during that relocation act, I remember a lot of those people always came home during the fishing season to fish to harvest, to do something with us. They always came back to Stomish celebration. And um, a huge majority of them all came back and did not go into the trades that the Relocation Act was training them for. They came right back and did what they were brought up to do. Well, like when I was, when I was sent away to go on relocation, I went to uh, Tacoma, uh, what do they call them, schools you go to learn how to weld and all that? Trade Real, uh, what do they trade call school, Trade school. Trade school or something, that's where I went. And my wife worked and I went to school. And we, all my kids got down there and we stayed there and that's how I was building his house and uh, I'd go to school and work all week and come home and work on the house and we, that's all we did, go back and forth. And it wasn't that bad, it was, I think the kids didn't mind it. The 
long story short is I had the opportunity to go fishing for two weeks for herring uh, and came up, took vacation from my work and the herring never showed up and they never showed up and I'm going now what do we do and thank uh, Linda for saying kind of emotional for me that she was uh, giving enough to say go ahead quit your job and go fishing yeah, no matter what the government did with us <laughs> we we still came back strong <laughs> These things were historical because the river did run a different way at one time, you know. And that needs to be identified because there was a way it identified itself. The tributaries, and you can see the effect because someone changed it. Before that, that we maintained it. See, that was the thing. My Uncle Dutch would always say, well, let's do it first, and then we'll tell, ask him about it, okay? <laughs> that was the old Indian uh, word to say. If you ever wanted to do something, just do it, and then go talk to him about it. Because then they won't have anything to say, because they'll know why we did it. Because we didn't do it to harm anybody. We're doing it to protect the resource as well as to protect the river. Because that river is alive. That's the whole problem people don't understand. And it kept people alive. Respect yourself, respect others, and a little love will go a long way. That's my, that's the end of my story. <laughs>